Thank you again. I feel lucky to work a place with such a wonderful manager, and I got great coworkers, Kate and April, out here helping, and uh, Mike. You'll see. So we got good folks uh, here to help you. And uh, uh, again, um, no birthdays, huh? I, that's the only song I know on the harmonica. I can, I can play something, but anyway. All right. And the other thing is, are there any uh, members of uh, the Peep Fan Club? The Peeps. No, no, wow. All right, well, when you become a member of the Peep Fan Club, you get a hat, you get a shirt, you get a free free box of Peeps. So that, you read the box sometimes, hey, you sign up, and uh, you can become a, uh, I was the president of the chapter. No, I wasn't. But anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, cookies are now available fresh out of the oven. Anybody like a fresh cookie? Go pass those things around there. Good ones. So, okay, yeah, all right. So anyway, it's just nice to have a, a nice crowd here. You know, we got one of the best nurseries uh, in uh, the state, I think. Um, uh, it's just, uh, we got so many uh, th options available for you to get on the carts and drive around. And uh, you know, it'll get much more colorful in the next few weeks as uh, the warms up and all the flowers and plants start blooming and stuff. So anyway, it's fun to come out and make sure you uh, uh, check out how nice it is when it was, was just come to like, like going to our Arboretum or a park because it's a real pretty place to come. But today I'd like to uh, share uh, some ideas about uh, creating a bird habitat and uh, uh, this, <clears throat> at this time of the year we uh, talk about um, uh, the, the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is going to happen uh, next weekend. So we're going to get a little information about that. But let me uh, see if this will work here. Okay, good. Yeah, so if we were around 60 million years ago, this is what the birds would look like, kind of. So, you know, but now they've kind of evolved into this kind of thing here. So they're kind of close, I guess, don't you? Think? Little changes through evolution, but uh, anyway, a little minor change. But um, what I'd like to begin with is to talk a little bit about this bird count coming up because it's a real opportunity to uh, kind of connect with the whole world and see what, uh, what the condition of our planet is as far as our birds. So, uh, you know, it started out as being the sort of American thing, but now it's gotten to be all around the world. So it's a real opportunity for you to, uh, you know, learn more about the birds and, and keep track of what's in your neighborhood maybe when you set up your little uh, habitat or your bird feeders, whatever it is. And uh, you can uh, report all your uh, findings, and uh, this is uh, like being a citizen scientist. So you can uh, really uh, help uh, the, all the scientists out and naturalists by uh, reporting what you find. So in the, uh, uh, several organizations, uh, Audubon and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and uh, Bird Studies of Canada all uh, uh, take part in this. So uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So, uh, the, first of all, the, the, it has gone global. It used to be just the, uh, here in the uh, United States, but now all over the world they're reporting. Uh, you go to the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, Backyard Bird Count, plus your e, you set up an eBird account, and uh, you can uh, log in what you learn, what you see, what time of year, and all that kind of stuff. So, you get to start your own little uh, bird list. You can count them from anywhere. You can do it at your, in your own yard. You can do it at a nature center, at a park, a school, somewhere where you think there might be a lot of birds or you, something you might like to uh, keep track of. And the reason why you want to take part is because these scientists, there's only not enough scientists really. So more scientists to, to help, uh, help them out is always a good thing. You've got uh, a way to keep track of the records and, uh, and make sure that all the birds that uh, are represented in your community. So uh, you'll see that now there's 135 countries, 4,296 species, all these checklists, 17 million birds counted. So you can participate anywhere, you can access your bird list, use your account year round. So it's a nice little way to connect. Um, so what you basically do is you find a place, like whether it's your home or a nearby park, uh, you can go and uh, count the birds for at least 15 minutes, uh, identify your species, and uh, keep track of your time. Nice little chickadee there. And try to get a number. You're going to want to submit a little number for them. And it's nice when they get in a nice row like this for you. It's kind of a lot much easier. Generally, a lot of times, you're in big flocks of uh, 
hundreds. And it, the way you got to do that is kind of pick out a part and count a little section of it, go 20, then go one, four, five times, something like that. Maybe you can an estimate. So uh, there's ways to do it, little tricks to learn how to count. Um, let's see. You're going to need a new checklist for every day you, uh, for each location and different times of day. And make sure you know to that. Those Canada geese. And you go to your website. You can enter bird, birdcount.org is the website. And uh, submit your things by creating your own account. And if you already got it, just take, pull it up. You can make a note of where you're, uh, where you're watching the birds. And all these little, they have all these little uh, prompts to help you uh, identify your spot. And uh, put in your date what you were looking at. You can um, put all your information about the time and how long you looked. Then it'll bring up the list of all the birds for you. And it's usually alphabetical. You just uh, make notes. Uh, if, you're, if it's a complete list, and kind of check you through it. But you know uh, all the things to, uh, to do to submit your list, put your details, what you saw, how many of those. And then you submit, send an email to yourself, and so the things we learned from that is uh, the year-to-year -year changes in numbers of all the different birds, patterns of their migration, and uh, how the, they might be affected by climate and urbanization, and what diseases are out there. So it's a nice way <coughs> to keep track of uh, what's out there. So you can include your family, let your folks, friends know, and uh, be a nice family activity. So these other websites, Audubon and Cornell Lab, you can bring any of those up and they'll be able to answer any questions. So that's the uh, Backyard Bird Count next weekend, Valentine weekend, 13th through the 16th. So it'd be a fun thing for you to do. So the other part of uh, <clears throat> why we're talking about bird habitat is, and this is where I get to use my, uh, you know, I got that darn master's of green philosophy and I hardly ever get to use it. But here's an opportunity. Why do we have a bird habitat? And uh, if you look at the, the modern era, Basically, this was, uh, you know, the ideal lawn, you know, or ideal situation. You move out to the suburbs, you buy a house, you put a little line of shrubs in there, and put a big lawn, right? So that was kind of the, the modern way of uh, having a home. And uh, it, it, the thing is, uh, what they did is, you know, they cleared out a lot of habitat, a lot of native plants, everything else, so they can make these kind of suburbs. So you get hundreds of thousands of square miles of this, and the, where's the habitat for birds? So, you know, part of the reason why we want to encourage people to, you know, start bringing uh, bird habitat into their homes or their areas because, you know, they, they need something to eat. And so they need some habitat. So anyway, this is uh, kind of the mentality. So uh, the postmodern response to the modern problems uh, is to have, a, a, you know, create more of the native habitats, bring back the adapted plants that, you know, that will attract the birds and butterflies and get the critters back in. You know, what, the, the other thing about this was trying to uh, keep nature away, really. You know, you want to try to keep all the, all the animals and birds, everything, just kind of bugs, keep them away, spray everything so that you don't have these things. So, but they're finding out that that's been pretty harmful and the species are declining. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of pesticides involved in that. So what happens, you know, a lot of it got into the streams, kills a lot of fish, or the birds eat the fish. They, they're dying off, there was a real problem, right? In the 60s, they started realizing, you know, Rachel Carson and that whole environmental movement was kind of looking at it, we're killing our, our environment, we're gonna be killing ourselves, the eagles were in decline. So anyway, people started waking up and realizing that we needed to either tone down the chemicals or create more habitat that can bring those kind of species back. So <clears throat> if you can create a bird habitat, then you know, you'll have nature closer again and so, now this was a nice attempt, uh, <clears throat> you know, but those are purple martin houses, which I don't think they're quite high enough for them. And you know, they can't really see them, but you know, the one thing about purple martins is that, you know, a lot of people would put those houses up at first because they thought it would, uh, they would take care of the mosquitoes. But it turns out that they were eating the dragonflies and other things that really did eat the uh, mosquitoes. So the purple <laughs> martins really didn't, didn't work out very good. They're nice to fly and watch when they're flying around and everything is kind of fun. But otherwise, um, um, you know, the, you know, there's not much attraction for uh, purple martins anymore. But anyway, they got like a little yard art. But anyway, uh, 
So try to get a bird habitat going. And let's see, if, uh, you can do it by, this is what you might be able to get if you uh, get rid of the lawn. You know, what do you have a lawn for anyway? I mean, and when we had kids, you know, they had to play out there, but then they grow up. Oh, what, what do you get, four or five years of a kid playing in the yard, you know? <laughs> Then after that, you know, they're gone and you got to cut the grass, right? So, you know, uh, <coughs> so, you know, I'm all for uh, landscapes now that, you know, limited, well, I have grass in a monoculture basically that you got to pull out the machine and cut and use chemicals. So anyway, you can create a little habitat with a little, something that will attract the birds and the butterflies. Um, this is a, <coughs> a little habitat here. You can see it's a, I get, there's several feeders in here. Um, there's a trellis in here too. Well, I, I got some other angles of this. <clears throat> but uh, the other thing too you might notice uh, is that the uh, windows on the doors there, those are all glass. So uh, we, there was a problem with birds flying in there. Mm -hmm. So we put that up and they were easy to pull back if we were sitting out or anything like that. And, um, <clears throat> and they actually have a nice little flow when the breeze blows. So. And you can still see through that. But anyway, it put the birds from flying into the... Is this your uh, yard? That is my yard, yeah. Oh. So. Um, Anyway, uh, but now there, we've got something else too. We, we left one up, but on the other windows there's this uh, uh, para, parachute cord that you can put down like, like there's a certain like four and a half, four and three quarter inches apart. You put these strings on, on like a, a curtain rod and the birds won't fly into that either. And, and with our eyeballs we can see through it and that doesn't block our vision. So there's ways to, you know, if you have trouble with birds flying into your windows, there's, there's some uh, uh, ways to take care of that. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing I want to point out too is having uh, kind of those shrubs that are kind of full. This is a yopan that <clears throat> I keep shaped a little bit. And uh, that gives the birds something to fly into when, uh, you know, we're getting attacked by a hawk or something coming in. They got some place to get, in, get in, and hide. And I'll show you more of that too. So anyway, but the thing is you get, get a lot of pretty flowers. You get the things that attract the, uh, all kinds of birds. There's a red yucca in this container here and that blooms all summer long with little, little red flowers at the, and hummingbirds come to it every day. Um, what is that called? This one here? Yeah, well, that's goldenrod. Okay. Yeah, and there's a trellis in there too, so the birds sit on the trellis, they come into the feeders, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun place. So basically, how do you attract the birds? Basically, you want to have some food, you want to have some water, you like to have some housing. And um, of all the things, uh, you know, I would almost say that water is almost more important than the food. Because if you put out a bird bath and a nice bird bath, keep it clean, they'll come to that every day. So uh, having water is just as, uh, probably as most important as having the food out. And you want to provide some shelter. So we're going to, uh, let's see. So there's all kinds of bird baths out there. And um, I, right off the bat, just don't buy the cheap ones. They don't last. You know, they're little cement ones. They fall apart, they, you know, the freeze gets them, and so they just don't last. Go ahead and get a, a one that's, a, a, you know, well-made. Uh, all ours are uh, reinforced concrete, and uh, they'll, they'll last much longer. And the other thing is uh, be careful not to get ones that are too deep. A lot of times you'll see them at the other nurseries or stores and stuff. they got these bird baths, but they're real deep, and birds generally can't get into them. They have to have that uh, slow, graded, graded kind of walk into the water there so they can take a bath. The, the deep ones might be good for chickens or something that might get in there. I don't know. I don't know who they're for, but they can get a drink out of them maybe. But other than that, um, they do like the sound of water too. Uh oh, am I still connected? That was the, uh, that was the other one. <laughs> okay. Sorry, but uh, they do like the sound of water, and uh, they, they, they hear it. Know that attracts them as well. And the moving water keeps it a little fresher too. So if you got a little fountain, a little water feature, you'll see the birds will come to it. So I really recommend those. Uh, when it comes to the food you want to provide, you know, there's all kinds of things you can get, but mostly, you know, and there's you can get and you go with the cheap stuff, but you know, you'll find out that mo the birds don't eat it all because it's all a, little, a lot of filler, and you'll see a little grass patch under your bird feeder, which means you got it ripped off. So, you know, get, buy the better seed, get the ones that's all the, the sunflower seed that they'll really, um, you know, they'll eat that all up. And there's, a, uh, you know, like I have several different types of food at, at my feeders. You know, between the suet, so there's a suet, uh, there's a, um, these blocks that are kind of nice. Um, 
uh, there's hummingbird food, but uh, I have safflower and I have uh, peanuts and uh, finch food. There's a finch food and niger seed. So I have these uh, in different spots too because the uh, finches, uh, particularly goldfinch and house finch, don't like to compete with the bigger birds and the other feeders. So if you give them a little finch feeding station uh, off to their cell, uh, they, they're happy and it's kind of fun. So you get a nice variety of birds by having a little more uh, variety in their diet. So uh, look around for the good food, get the good stuff. And we, uh, we do uh, have the Wild Delight, which is a real good company for uh, eating quality bird foods. Uh, you know, they're good mixes and not, not too much is being wasted or anything like that. So uh, they're nice and uh, designated for, uh, to attract certain birds. So, so check that out. Uh, when it comes to the housing, um, there's all kinds of ways to, you know, in nature, the, the cavities are hard to find, really. You know, they're all, they're, when if there's a little cavity, the birds or squirrels, somebody's going to try and get in there and live. So there's a real uh, demand for uh, enough cavities uh, in nature. So in fact, I just at my uh, yard yesterday, I had a couple of big trees nearby and there were three woodpeckers, different types of woodpeckers, uh, trying to fight for the same hole. And uh, so they had the downy, the flicker, and the red-bellied were all kind of you know, facing off each other, trying to get into this new hole that appeared or something. So anyway, being able to provide some cavities, some houses, you'll see someone will move in. And, uh, you know, you can even uh, use a bedpan. You ever thought about getting any bedpans left <laughs> over, you know? We're probably opposed to that. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, you're, if you're not using it. Uh, you know, there's a, a, anything could be a feeder. Anything, you'd be creative with your houses. The other part is the opportunity to uh, have a little art in the yard, too. So that's the other thing. Uh, you know, when I go back to that house that it just had the big lawn and a little line of shrubs. You know, what kind, of, what kind of life are you bringing into the yard, if any? There's, it's like a dead zone, right? Who's, who's there? Who comes in? You, you offer some food, some water, some housing. You're going to have some energy of the birds coming in. You're going to have uh, critters come to visit. So, you know, you bring in some life. You bring your yard to life. So that's uh, part of the fun, again, of having a, uh, providing a habitat. So the, uh, there are all kinds of birdhouses out there. And... Uh, there's all kinds of things. Look at that. What a great idea. You got some old shoes? Perfect, right? And, um, you know, uh, the, particularly the wrens, you know, the wrens will do this. You know, you put up big fancy houses and they're going to go find an old shoe or a box some, somewhere in the corner of your yard and, and make their nest in that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, opportunity for some art, too. You know, birdhouses can be cool, right? There's all kinds of fun birdhouses out there. I know there's a nice booth at the Fowler and Garden Show that has all kinds of birdhouses. And they're fun to, fun to have. So you gotta pay attention a little bit to their hole, make sure it's uh, the right size for certain birds. Uh, you know, these are kind of nice. Uh, first of all, they kind of, you know, they look like eggs, which, you know, if they're looking for a nest, they've got eggs in their mind already, right? So, you know, they want to put their eggs in a bigger egg. So, anyway, those are kind of, and, and being glass, it's kind of this kind of stuff. They, other birds can't break into it or chew it off or make the hole bigger or anything. So, anyway, they're kind of fun looking too, they hang in your trees. Uh, so anyway, provide some housing, you'll see they'll use it. There you go, look at that. A nice, nice big condo here in the city. Andy Warhol. Yeah, 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 look at that color. So you can have fun with house. And, uh, oh, well, this is just a little diversion. I took a trip out west. Uh, this is in the Nash, uh, Painted Desert National Park. Man, anybody been to that park? It's amazing, man. I, you know, sometimes we're on the way to the Grand Canyon. We go, ah, it's just a painted desert. But uh, you need to stop in that park because it was really uh, amazing, colorful. And that, that to me, uh, you know, there's a lucky camera shot. I just looks like a painting more than a picture almost to me. So anyway, just thought I'd share that with you. Anyway, all right. So um, so anyway, uh, when you want, if you try to pr uh, provide a habitat for the birds, you're going to bring in the right plants. So. Uh, you know, if you're bringing in azaleas and you bring in your, your boxwoods and your, all these kind of standard plants, um, you know, they're not going to bring anything in. And, you know, the Nandina, in fact, you know, don't bring that one in because it, it's, it's gotten to be point. They found out there was uh, too much cyanide in those berries and the birds are getting poisoned by them. So, you know, not only is it an invasive species, but, you know, it, it's killing the birds too. So if you see Nandinas, send them back to China or wherever they came from. But um, anyway, if you bring in the right plants, you're going to bring in the right critters and the right birds that you want. And, you know, one of my favorite trees is a, a serviceberry. 
Serviceberry is, a, again, a native tree. It's kind of like the dogwood. It blooms full of flowers in the spring, makes a lot of berries, outstanding fall color, good understory, uh, easy, hardy tree. And the dogwood is kind of just that, is nice too, as far as getting your, your blooms and berries and fall color. Uh, the possum hog, I got a nice sample out here of one. Uh, you'll see this oftentimes along the highway if you're driving down highway 40 or 30 you see all this bush full of berries and that's the possum hall holly and they're uh, you know there's enough hollies around that they that doesn't seem to be a problem no right yeah they're, they're they'll all pretty much make berries how does the Arkansas French tree work out as a well, French tree is a nice native tree, and you just have the pretty little fringe flowers, but I'm not sure what it offers as far as food or well, shelter. Like grape, like. They get some little small grapes, yeah. Yeah, they're actually pretty large. We oh. saw that Pinnacle Mountain, or well, when the tree was Oh, big. good. And it's one of those sort of, I don't know, sort of weird kind of cross-pollination hybrid. Uh-huh. Yeah. Maybe they need something. They, they might need another pollinator to uh, well, make it berry. You, know, you have to have a male, female. And okay. Then, and even then, yeah, yeah, good. I just wondered whether they were... Well, if you can get them to make the berries, I would think they would be good, good providers, good native plants. Uh, you know, the wax myrtle is uh, interesting in that it's an evergreen shrub, and there's a dwarf variety, you know, one that gets a little bigger, 10, 12 feet tall. But it's an evergreen, and um, there's a particular little bird, the uh, uh, yellow rumped warbler, really likes to hang out in these. So if you have one of these around, you have a good chance you'll get that pretty little warbler in there. And uh, there's, there's a, they produce a little berry that the birds like too. So there's a category there. Uh, some shrubs like the uh, American Beauty Berry, they'll come eat the berries off of that. The red buckeye will start to bloom right about the time the hummingbirds are migrating. So, uh, um, you know, that's a, a pretty plant to have out there. And they make the buckeyes too. So other critters will get those. If you try to get another uh, grouping of perennials, uh, the sages uh, attract the, the butterflies and the birds are attracted to the cone flowers. And there's that red yucca, which, uh, you know, <coughs> the Southwest is moving this way probably, with climate change and all. So. Anyway, these kind of plants are uh, native and uh, they're adapting. I mean, they're making it here pretty good. So, And again, it makes all those blooms and the, the hummingbirds come every day. So pretty little plant. And it doesn't need much water. It's fairly drought resistant. Um, so I, I like to put a sign out in case the birds are flying by, they can say, oh, there's a sanctuary. <laughs> so, you know. Um, the smarter birds. That's right, yeah, 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 I have to be old enough to read, yeah, so. But uh, anyway, you can see the little trellis, they come and sit in my trellis here, and uh, yeah, you see the little baffles, we do have bird issues, I mean the squirrel issues, and you know, I, I, you have to try and place those, uh, uh, in the right distance away from things they can jump to. I think some, some folks were asking, how are we going to keep the squirrels out of our feeders? Well, it is a matter of uh, distance. you got to do the little baffles. Um, a couple of years ago, we had some squirrels that were smarter and uh, more agile than their average ones, and they were able to jump from here over to the feeder. And they were, you know, it took several tries and attempts, but they were doing it. You know, it was amazing. They like take off and they grab onto it. You know, you got to admit, they're fun to watch. So. Anyway, uh, it's worth it to try and figure it out. And the other thing is, well, we'll talk about some more. So anyway, i offer a little habitat. So here's a, kind of the winter scene. Uh, you can see, again, different types of feeders. I got a shelf feeder. I got the safflower. I got a suet. There's a peanut feeder. I actually I put out the peanuts for them. They, they like those. Some birds like that. Another little shelf feeder there. Here's a little bird bath there. I got like four or five bird baths in my yard. And uh, this is a service berry tree here too. And um, the one thing, the other thing I want to point out too is in the background, that's a, a, a row of shrubs called the winter berry, barberry, winter barberry. And <clears throat> the one thing about it is full of thorns, but it's great uh, um, roosting and, and hiding for all the little smaller birds. So, uh, you know, a hawk will come through and the birds, everybody scatters, and they all go into that kind of a hiding place because the hawk is, can't get into it. It's, it's, it's too thick for them. So um, it's nice to have that kind of uh, uh, habitat for them to get safe into. So you know, part of the thing is when you're planning or considering your bird habitat, consider the levels of how the, uh, the birds will approach your feeders in your, your, your area. 
So, you know, we try to have some bigger trees, they'll come in, they'll see your place. But it's nice to have another low, lower level, mid-level kind of tree. Dogwood, serviceberry, red buds, whatever, that kind of level. They come down and get a little closer and they can make their way in. And if they have some place they can run and hide because of a potential predator coming after them, they'll, uh, they'll be even happier. So anyway, to have that, uh, that uh, level of uh, coming down and if they get down in the, the ground, they have some tall grasses they can hide into. So anyway, consider that. So let's talk about some of the potential issues. And we did mention the squirrels. So, you know, they got to eat too. <laughs> so I go ahead and feed them. And you know, if they're eating that, they're not going to be messing with the, the, the bird food so much either. So again, you know, they're, uh, to me, they're entertainment. And uh, to watch them try to figure out how to get to a feeder and how to climb up and uh, how to use it, I just, you know, what's it? Uh, does it, it's not that much more to really put out a corn cob or uh, those big uh, corn roll things. Um, <clears throat> so, and there's bafflers now, and there's feeders. This kind of feeder, look, the bird, or uh, the squirrel gets on this and closes it. So, you know, bird, there's two, two, the, the lighter birds can still sit on that, okay. But something heavy closes it off, that'll discourage them. So, there's, there's ways, there's ways. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned hawks, and here he is. Look, he's sitting right on my feeder, man. He's, he's going, came, he flew into the yard and sat right on top there. I go, man. Where would everybody go? You know, yeah. for lunch. That's right. You know, everybody come on back. I'm not. A, so anyway, and boy, they 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 they're pretty agile. They're quiet for one. Those Cooper hawk. Uh, they're beautiful bird, but boy, they they're, they're quiet. They fly in without a sound and snatch somebody up, and for you know they get doves. Poor doves. But, you know, this is part of the system, you know, that's how it works. Uh, with a red-tailed hawk, they, that one came into the backyard and uh, uh, went after a squirrel nest, a baby squirrel. He, he tore up a baby squirrel nest. And went, oh, no! But, you know, they, most of them survived, I think. Uh, well, look at that cat. Ooh, cats. That's a bad cat because he's outside. All cats should be inside. Is anybody, you know, <laughs> it's the only place for a cat. So if you do happen to let them out, a pet cat gets out, put a little bell on their neck or something, and so that way they can't, uh, uh, they can maybe the birds get a little warning when they're coming. So, but you know, they're the natural born killers, those cats, you know, they just kill things. But anyway, uh, they should go back to the planet they came from. If <laughs> so, oh, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is true, right, right. But uh, so the other thing is uh, pesticides too. You know, quit using poisons in your yard. You know, there's enough organic things out there that are priced comparably and do the job and uh, uh, don't put poison out there. So that kills off more birds as much as cats. So try to go organic with all your uh, yard treatment, fertilizers <coughs> and whatever else you need to, to use. So there's a lot of good product out there. So keep away from the chemicals. So, um, so here's a go. So why have a bird habitat? <clears throat> so the one thing about having birds around is it, it tells you that your environment's healthy. You know, if, if there's uh, some birds that may be missing or somehow they're not showing up anymore, maybe there's something going on in, the, in your habitat, in your area. So, uh, you know, they're, they're a great indicator of uh, a healthy uh, ecosystem. You know, the birds eat the bugs and, you know, this is a, as a master naturalist know, where you uh, we're an insect planet, really. If you we got these graphs that we look at, that uh, have all the living species on the planet, all the things, all the kinds of critters and species. You know, what two thirds of it's insects. You got a little sliver of mammals, a little sliver of birds, bigger sliver of uh, of uh, you know, uh, fish. But basically, this is an insect planet, and uh, we do have to live with them. And the thing is, you know, uh, the, the insects are what the birds are after, and that's how a lot of them eat. So, anyway. Um, <clears throat> You know, try to keep a balance. Birds help us keep some of that uh, balance down with the with the insects. But you know, the insects are pollinating and uh, they're taking, they're doing their job. Oh, okay, you get a little free fertilizer, right? They poop in your yard, I guess. You get nice color. You know, humans we we want to see color. We want we like color enough. We like art. And uh, in the in the grays of winter, you know, it's not like a the red flash of a cardinal or a blue blue jay coming up or. Uh, the, the, the little yellow uh, goldfinches. So, you know, just be able to see that little color, just, you know, it's uh, one of the things we love. And you get the songs, what a deal. 
they're nice little singers. Sometimes nice just to crack the window at this time of year. They're all talking and singing. And uh, there's, of course, all the entertainment, trying to figure out what those birds are all talking and doing and why they're competing. Or, you know, you get all the house sparrows all together and they're all chattering. You say, What's going on in there? So, you know, it's just fun to uh, uh, con consider, uh, you know, their, what birds are doing and thinking how they act and behave. So uh, there is a little feng shui aspect of, uh, you know, through... Uh, Feng Shui is about channeling energy, and uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I know that much that, uh, you know, if you can in invite the good energy into your yard, uh, into your environment, you know, then things will be good for you. So, uh, one of the things about bringing in the birds, it's that energy, that's that activity, hummingbirds, uh, butterflies, birds, you have all that coming into your area, it's, I mean, look how boring that, uh, that you know, the lawn was with the little row of shrubs. So, Bring in all the interest that, that they come for, and you get the energy, and so you kind of benefit from that. And of course, you know, nothing feels better than sitting out and watching them too, so nice stress relief. So anyway, a lot of reasons to have a bird habitat. So I'm going to go through a few uh, types of birds here that you most likely will see. Uh, you know, this would be a, a good start, uh, but really, uh, once you start bringing in these, these birds that are kind of in your neighborhood already, uh, they'll bring in the other kind of more fun ones, you know, some of the other warblers and different uh, uh, vireos and things like that. But I'm going to go through some of the basics. Everybody knows the cardinal, great red bird. Uh, the chickadees and the titmice, if, uh, this is, uh, if you, you always always see these two together. And uh, nice little calls, sweet little calls. Uh, the cedar waxwing, those are the ones that are starting to move into the area now. Those are the ones that come through and eat all the berries off everything. So uh, you know, you'll see that uh, um, uh, if you've got a holly or the yopon or anything that has berries, they, they come in a flock, usually sometimes 20, 30 of them at a time. Clean the, the shrub off and move on to the next one. So, and they're a beautiful bird, that uh, mask and the little yellow on their tail. they got red on their wings. It's the coolest looking little bird. So uh, they're fun to have them come around. How large are they in relation? They're like a cardinal almost, almost about the same size as a cardinal, yeah. <coughs> they're beautiful, yeah. You'll see them. They're, I saw the first one in my neighborhood yesterday. So they're starting to make their way. And they'll, they'll be hanging out here at the nursery because we have a lot of berries. This is great bird habitat here. <laughs> so, you know, and it's, we got the stream in the back. If you, if you want to go do a little birdie and go look for some birds, we've got some really neat ones out back uh, by the creek. Um, so anyway, with all the berries, are, they're coming through here too. So here's uh, the kind of woodpecker you'll see in, uh, in this area. You know, the pileated woodpecker will come to your bird feeder if you put stuff out. And it's a big bird too. You'll know it when it's there. And uh, they, they got a call, it sounds like monkeys. It's kind of a neat little call. Uh, the yellow belly sapsucker doesn't always come to feeders, but they, uh, they'll be up in the trees nearby. And when they see all the other woodpeckers going after stuff, they come and check it out. Uh, you can tell it's just got a little yellow belly, it's got the red chin, uh, it's something that's kind of fun to see. Now this is the red-headed woodpecker, which we have some back by the creek, and um, that gets confused with this one, which is the red-bellied woodpecker. And you can see they both have red heads, but that one's got a lot more red head. And the black is real, much more distinctive on that one. And this one's called red belly. I wish I, I should have got a shot where there's a little red on the belly, not much. You really got to look close. Oh yeah, there's a little red on his belly. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, that one's a little bigger too. The little downy, you'll see that one a lot at the feeders and the flicker, of course. Uh, they're, they're always on the ground almost. They'll come up and get suet as well, but they do have to go after ants and bugs in the ground. And uh, it's a pretty bird too because it's got the little red, it's got a little mustache. Well, the male has the mustache, the female doesn't. And there's a nice bib on there on this front, and the yellow feathers, spots, streaks, it's got everything. It's a fun bird. The little nut hatches are fun. Uh, I don't know how they do that with their neck. I guess it hurts, hurts to think about it. But anyway, the red-breasted and the white-breasted, they'll come to your feeders. They climb up and down the trees, so they just climb. Real nice little climbers. The wren, there's two types of wren, at least in this area. Uh, the Carolinas, most likely, is what you'll see, a little tan, rusty uh, uh, breast. And uh, the Buicks is a little grayer and whiter. Uh, there's the finches. You've got uh, the purple finch, male and female there, and the house finch over here. They're pretty similar. The, the, the purple finch is a little bigger, and it's got a little more of a brow as opposed to the 
uh, house finch. Goldfinches, of course, the female. And most of the males kind of look like uh, this at this time of year. And through the spring, they're going to get more golder and yellower and brighter. And usually about the time they get like that, they migrate up north and <laughs> you don't get to see all the great yellow so much. But so, so, sometimes they stick around and, and stay with us. But generally, it's kind of just fun to watch them, though, uh, <clears throat> change colors and get, get brighter. And then, you know, you got your nice category of blues with the uh, blue jays, uh, the bluebird, indigo buntings. Indigo buntings are more of a meadow kind of bird, but they'll sometimes when they, they're passing through and they see all the other birds at the, at the feeders, they'll come and check it out and see what's going on and see what they can eat. But it is a really a beautiful bluebird. And you know, in the real eastern bluebird is a pretty little bird too. Uh, you can put, they like if you set up a house, more likely they'll move in and uh, they'll come, come to your feeders as well. Uh, more, uh, oh, this is starting to get into the, the sparrow world, which is, can be tricky, but if you know some of these basic ones, like um, the, the house sparrow, this is uh, one that uh, uh, you'll see uh, around a lot of feeders. And uh, in fact, you know, I gave you a, a little hand out there too, which I invite you to read. I, I was going to read it to you, but you know, uh, it's kind of interesting about the, how sparrows are in decline, which, you know, Part of, again, the, the idea of this uh, counting birds and be, being part of a, uh, a bird count is uh, seeing what's going on with the birds. And this bird is, is one that's declining. And what's interesting you'll see from that article is that they've been with us forever. Uh, you know, as long as humans are around, the, uh, that little house sparrow has been nearby, within 400 yards. And they don't, go any further, they don't go any further away from humans than like 400 yards. And so they've been with us all through over the, all the continents everywhere. And, uh, but now they're in decline, and you know, that's, that's a little warning bell for us, a little flag that maybe we better pay attention what's, what's causing their decline. And so, um, anyway, even though it seems like a, a common little bird, you know, they're, 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 little, they're trying to tell us something that, you know, maybe something's not right with the environment or something. So <clears throat> these kind of counts uh, kind of help us uh, look at uh, issues like that. So anyway, uh, it, it's not such an insignificant bird, so. It uh, really tells us something. Uh, you know, you can tell, you'll see it oftentimes with the white-throated sparrow, uh, sparrow, which uh, they, uh, they migrate, so they're here at this time of year, and uh, they do have those lures, they're so yellow, they're starting to turn as the breeding season comes on, and uh, they, the really white throat really shows up, they only they have the white throat, and um, a pretty little song that, <whistles> that one, they can, uh, Make that little call. You'll hear that in the outside in the mornings. The yellow rumped warbler is just a pretty little bird, uh, nice little yellow coloration in there. And this is what it looks like when it's breeding. So it's starting to get into that that look. I mean, it's like a different bird. So anyway, that's a uh, pretty little birds that come. Um, more sparrows. The fox sparrow will, will come to the feeder. They'll be on the ground mostly, and they're a little bigger. You'll see if there's a one sparrow that looks bigger than the others. It has that little uh, heart patch, and a little grayer on top, and a bright rusty color on its back. Nice streaks, bolder streaks. Little chipping sparrow, you'll notice he's got a little, little uh, rufous crown there. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes people will think that this might be a sparrow, but that's the female uh, rose-breasted grosbeak, because it looks uh, somewhat sparrow-like, but it has a little more coloration in its uh, breast and a little bigger beak. It's a huge beak compared to the other birds. And there's the male, the rose breast. He's got that big red patch on it. Pretty birds. So they, they migrate through. They'll come to the feeder for maybe a couple weeks and keep moving on. How do you do this? There it goes. Uh, some ground birds too, you know, I, I put a lot of times the bird goes, uh, the food goes on the ground. I put seed on the ground often for uh, the birds that like to uh, scratch around, the doves will eat on the ground. The brown thrasher is a pretty bird too. It's a nice size, it's a good size, like a, almost, and it's like a roadrunner, close to the roadrunner family, but not near that size. But <clears throat> has that activity of running around on the ground. And a nice rusty color, a uh, big yellow eye. And you know, killdeers, and they've just come back to our neighborhood here. We have them here uh, at River Valley, and they make their nest in the gravel. And we have to set aside, you know, we got to put little barriers around where they, they, they put them in the middle of the, the driveways. 
and we have to put a little barrier so nobody runs over or hurts the eggs. And then when the when their babies hatch, they're like this. I mean, they're ready to go. They, they look like little. They're, they're, they look like a big one, only he's a little tiny. And they come out. They're running all, all over. It's kind of fun. Huh? It's amazing. And uh, you've probably seen the. I don't know if you've ever seen the the uh, kill deer do its little. Uh, uh, Diversion uh, technique there. Uh, the, you know, if you come too close to the nest, it starts, oh, it moves away and acts like his arm is broke. You know, come follow me over here, look out for me. You know, so anyway, they, they have a nice little act. In fact, the, uh, whoops, uh, let's see. Well, there was a little thing, but well, I'm going too far. I had a little, oh, the Mama Drama Award, yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, fun little bird there. All right, so here's some other little category of some grayer birds. The juncos, again, they come through at this time of year, through the winter time, and they'll head out. The male is real distinctive with the gray and, and the white on his breast. The female is almost sparrow-like sometimes, but they'll have a little gray with it. And they have white beaks, though. You'll see their white beaks will show up. Um, <coughs> oftentimes, the rufous-sided toe will come to your feeders. Uh, they'll be on the ground more, more than likely, and also the mockingbirds, you know, the nice big singers, you know, sing all day. And then your uh, dark uh, blackbirds, there's a starling, the, uh, starlings and grackles come in big flocks, right? So you got, uh, the, the, you'll tell the starling because it has a yellow beak and it has a short tail, and oftentimes they're speckled like that. And the grackle has a longer tail and a yellow eye, but you'll see those in big flocks. So. If you see the big flock and you're trying to count them, just uh, you can pretty much tell uh, hide by their tails. You know, uh, then there's the red-winged blackbird that oftentimes comes to the feeders, a nice, pretty little song. I love their little song. And then there's the cowbird, which you know everybody knows uh, how cowbirds act. They, uh, their little <coughs> thing is they, uh, they did, well, actually they've got to figure. I think that parenthood figured out. They just drop their kids off in somebody else's nest and then leave. And so, uh, you know, what, what a good idea. So anyway, so uh, anyway, they, uh, they, they used to go with the herds, the buffalo herds. They traveled, you know, uh, and with the herds all migrating and moving, they didn't have time to take care of kids. So they dropped their eggs off with another bird and let them take care of them. And uh, they still do that today, even though there's no buffalo, but uh, th th still a good way to not have to raise your kids. But anyway, there was, it's a problem in places where there's endangered uh, birds, like uh, in central Texas, they have uh, the golden cheek warbler there that's uh, endangered. And the cowbirds come into those nests and kick the babies out and put their birds in there. And so that's why that bird's kind of endangered. And um, so there's a real movement. And when you see a cowbird, they, they, they go after and kill them. They've they got little traps that catch the cowbirds and keep them from uh, hurting that other little bird. So. Uh, you'll notice uh, the bigger blackbirds, and this is usually the way you see vultures. Is, uh, uh, there's basically two types in this area, the turkey vulture and the black vulture. A lot more white on the turkey vulture, a little red head, only a little bit of white on the black vulture and a black head. So you'll, you'll be more than likely see them flying over. Um, then the crows, basically uh, what we have here is the uh, Highway carcass removal technicians is basically what we have here. So, there, thank goodness somebody's cleaning up the highway for us. <clears throat> so that's their job. So uh, create the habitat, count the birds, enjoy for years to come. I've got a couple other things here I wanted to uh, point out. Um, let's see. So there's different kinds of feeders here. Um, you can check all those things. I got binoculars. You're welcome to try those out. They uh, you different uh, grades and varieties of those and see how they work. I've got some resources over here of types of bird books you can get. Uh, I rec really recommend Sibley's. This was, seems to be the good one that covers everything. Easy to identify birds in there. But uh, National Geographic has one. Audubon has one. But try to find a, a guide that you find easy to work with. Um, what is, the other thing I want to talk about is budget too. You know, so how much do you want to put into birds? So, oh, before I go that far, look, I found my brush. When you're doing, when you go to do your uh, bird baths, uh, I always take my scrub brush and clean it out. They like clean water, and so you get a good brush for you when you go and clean it. But, uh, so this is one of the part of the budget is include a little brush. So. But, uh, you know, what do we do for entertainment and uh, 
you know, the, you know, the kind of things that where do we want to put our money kind of thing. And, you know, you think about our entertainment dollar, I guess so you're going to put it there, uh, you know, go to the movies, go out to eat, uh, cable TV, well, how many things you put your money in. So you, what you, whatever money you would like to invest in this is something that, you know, you need to determine, but realize that, you know, you really get a lot back as far as all the, the things you bring to your yard and into your environment. And um, <clears throat> so... That's why, you know, you got the, the $250 binoculars and you got the $1,500 binoculars. But, you know, uh, it all depends on your interest and what you're willing to, to put into it. Uh, if you get a couple of bird baths, you get a better bird bath or uh, better bird feeders, uh, you know, it kind of comes, does come back to you get what you pay for. And that comes back to uh, how much enjoyment you can get out of it. And so, you know, the way I justify uh, all the bird food I buy is, you know, I, we don't, I don't smoke cigarettes, so. You know, look at all that money I'm saving in there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't drink alcohol. Oh, man, look at that. Oh, I got a lot of money left over from all that, too. So, you know, there's nice ways to justify um, where to put your, uh, the things you love and the uh, way to, you know, take care of the environment and make a place that's uh, inviting for the birds and habitat. They bring the butterflies, brings in all the, uh, the kind of critters that make life fun. There's questions. Yeah, Gerald? Yeah, what, you've been burning for a long time. Uh, what are the major differences in burning now and burning 10 years ago? Can you, can you tell us? Well, you know, the, the resources now are, are so much more available, it seems like. <laughs> All the birds. Oh, birds? Oh, well, so things like, uh, you know, there's uh, maybe some other master nationals can help. Like the, the scissor tail flycatcher never, was never here. And, uh, you know, it was only down in Texas. So that bird's moved up here. You'll see that every year now, and um, nice amounts of them, too. So their, their, their range is expanding. Uh, uh, two rivers, you know, so now. Right, yeah, down Two Rivers Park is a great place to go see birds. Can you interpret that in, the, in lieu of global warming? I, I think it might have something to do with it. Yeah, I know. It used to be, it didn't used to be as warm here as it was. So, yeah, it's warming up here. So that's part of it. So things like that. Um, I'm trying. There, there's a couple of things. You know, the snowy owl that never came here. It was here, been here the past couple of years. Uh, through the winter, it migrates down, comes kind of checking things out. I think it got tricked by. Uh, it thought those big wings of uh, the windmills in the, at the windmill factory. They thought those were drifts of snow, and so they were hanging out there for a while. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, it's warm enough, or or something that they, they brought the food the, them down to this area. So, um, uh, you know, there's a, a red cockaded woodpecker, which is kind of something you, you can't see very much anymore. It's kind of in a certain area. You know, anybody seen a uh, ivory-billed woodpecker yet? Nobody seen the ivory bill yet? No. Well, some people have, you know, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta go. Anyway, so. So, on the bird count, did they put out statistics? Oh, yeah, 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 you'll see, so they'll send the results. Here, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, they send out all the all the statistics <laughs> and what's out in your area, what's been seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. So, what else did I miss? Anything else? I yeah. Have a question about the hummingbird thing. Mm -hmm. What is the consensus on that? I've heard terrible things about using that, and then you know. It's it's all sugar water. Yeah. So, but this is a little concentrate, makes it a little easier. So, you know, they're, they're attracted to the red, so it, it, but really they're still attracted to the little uh, place there where they can uh, get the water. But the, the red brings them in first, uh, and the, you know, I've, I've seen, uh, we were watching, uh, uh, I guess it was a, a, a red-bellied woodpecker with a red head. It was up in a big tree, and the hummingbird went up to it. It just kind of just went up right up to it. Whoa, what's this? You know, so anyway, they're attracted to red things. So, but, you know, this just makes it easier. You can mix your own, right? Do you have to, do you don't have to have the red? Uh, no, no, yeah, no. As long as the feeder, because this, it can be clear in there, but they're, they're still going to come to the, well, the red here and, and, and drink from it. This one's got a nice one, because a lot of times you'll have a, a problem with ants. I don't know how ants find these things, you know, how you put one of these up in the middle of your house and how, how the ants know it's there and go with it. So anyway, you put water in the top here mm -hmm. and it keeps uh, the ants from going in there. So that's a good little 
Do you have to be somewhat of a fanatic keeping those clean though? Well, you know, it's uh, clean and it's also fresh. So you do have to, you know, the, they can, and with the heat, they can, it can get the spoil and, and they can make, get sick, I guess. So you need to change it out every three, four days when the, in, the, in the heat of summer. But, you know, it's, it's cheap stuff, it's sugar water. To the hummingbird? Mm -hmm. Not really. Raccoons, I just like, it. I found raccoons like the sugar water? water. Yeah, raccoons, raccoons are very good. Uh, yeah, if it's a <laughs> little sweet, uh, <laughs> sweet. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's like, uh, yeah, it's like a uh, soda pop. <laughs> yeah. It's like soda pop. <laughs> yeah. But then they'll chew on it too. Those coolies. Yeah, when it has the little wasp baskets around it too, because wasps will get in there and mm -hmm. choke yeah, off. That's yeah. I have one more question. Oh, yeah, sure. Your little deterrent in the picture there. The tubes. Oh. oh, yeah, this is a baffle. Yeah, that's a metal baffle. It's metal. Yeah. I got that at the Wild Bird store. Yeah, I got that at the Wild Bird store. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, anything else? So, uh, anyway, everybody, everybody have bird feeders? Anybody got them out? They're getting some stuff? Yeah, it's kind of fun, isn't it? Well, good. I think that's all I've got. Um, Kevin was going to have a drawing here. April. Oh, there you are. Good. So, um, anyway, yeah, I have a, let's see, I got one more slide to show you. So again, here we go. So here's uh, here's our folks. Uh, and we got April helping, and Tyler helps. Uh, Debbie counts our money. Nick's a good inventory guy. Uh, Scott, here's the owner. And Todd knows all about irrigation, and I pointed all the birds. So uh, yeah, that's right. There you go. All right, right. So uh, anyway, uh, hope, thanks for coming out, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we got great bird uh, baths and all these uh, things to bring the birds in and create the habitat. So come back often. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you.